Once radar was introduced by the British, the British were able to actually send up uh, pilots and air crews to intercept the, the Germans, and it really became the turning point for the Battle of Britain. Prior to this, the Germans had been able to fly to the UK, and the British were unaware that an air raid was coming. In the post-World War II time period, our, our understanding of how to measure radar was extremely infant at the time. One of the more interesting experiments was they took a T-33, and it was uh, a project called Passport Visa, and at the time they had, they had developed radar absorbent material. And the, the best way to think about this is it's linoleum, and they put linoleum all over the airplane. And the test reports detail Gus Grissom complaining that the plane was extremely sluggish. So it was a good test and it worked out. It showed that it did reduce the radar cross section of the airplane, but it was just not feasible to field it. So what they realized is they were going to have to build an airplane from the ground up. DARPA eventually awarded the contract to Lockheed to build a flyable version of the XST, codenamed Have Blue. And that was really the first manned airplane that was built with the sole purpose to evade radar. They go through a flight test program, about 100 flights. Both airplanes are actually lost. They crash them. But it proves that the technology works. The Air Force was looking at developing what became J-STARS. J-STARS is a, a battlefield awareness airplane. It would look down with the radar and it would look at the ground to see where enemy tanks were, enemy people, enemy trucks. Then it would beam this information back to uh, a headquarters where they could make decisions. So they went and they asked Northrop to, to build a stealthy version of J-STARS. And that's what Tacit Blue eventually became. So while it's not a direct lineal descendant of the B-2, the technology that was demonstrated in Tacit Blue definitely affected how they, they built the B-2. The, the first flight of the B-2 was, it was not secret. The United States had been very open with the, the general public that they were building at an, an advanced technology bomber. It was not a surprise to anyone when the B-2 took off for a two-hour flight from Palmdale, California and flew to Edwards Air Force Base there in California. So it was a very long evolution, a long flight testing time period. But you have to realize that there's only 20 of the airplanes, so they were coming off of the assembly line in a steady pace. But the, the 509th bomb wing at Whiteman was not fully operational capable because they didn't have enough airplanes yet. The airplane didn't enter combat until 1999, and that was with the Operation Allied Force Kosovo campaign. The towers fall on September 11th, 2001, and uh, the B-2 was Im immediately called in, uh, along with our B-52 forces. And on 7 October 2001, the B-2 actually led night one of Operation Enduring Freedom. A few years later, we moved to Operation Iraqi Freedom, and the B-2 was used again. The next combat for the B-2 was Operation o Odyssey Dawn. The B-2 flew over, destroyed 45 hardened aircraft shelters and made it very clear that there was no need to set up a no-fly zone over Libya because we had just destroyed his air force. So the reality is that one B-2 mission saved the taxpayers hundreds of millions of dollars. The B-2 combined with the technology of the Joint Direct Attack Munition is one of the most influential weapon systems in air power history. We needed that element of surprise. We needed to be able to sneak through the enemy's air defense systems through its radar and destroy targets that were very, very vital to the enemy. Stealth is more than likely the most important element for development of our airframes nowadays.